This is, this is something that would increase in areas of the body uh, where we've got a lot of uh, glycolysis happening. Again, we can sort of think of this as, as metabolically active areas of the body are going to have more 2, 3, DPG and favor unloading. Okay, so all these things help us help our hemoglobin let go of oxygen. Shift is probably a left shift. <laughs> One thing. There we go. Um, left shifts have the opposite property, right? So at the same PO2. All right, let's just follow that up. We have more hemoglobin, oxygen, hemoglobin saturation, right? More oxyhemoglobin for a left shift, okay? So these, these tend to favor the loading process, okay? That is, it's easier to keep oxygen on the hemoglobin rather than to take it away, okay? And these are all sort of the opposite properties, low temperature, low CO2, and so on, right? Um, so if, we're, if we have blood passing through a part of the body that's not particularly metabolically active, okay, it's not going to drop its oxygen quite as readily, okay? which is fine because the demand is not going to be very high. Okay? So these shifts in, in some ways help us to regulate the, um, the delivery of oxygen appropriately to metabolically active or inactive cells. Okay. Fetal hemoglobin is a left shift, right? It's, it's a permanent one, or at least as long as those red blood cells are in circulation, that helps to pull oxygen away from um, mom's blood. Okay, so that's a shift in the curve. Something weird's happening here. I can't seem to stop it. All right, so anybody here ever have carbon monoxide poisoning? No? Okay. Not a common one. Uh, okay, what kind of shift do we have here? First question, what sort of shift do we have? Anybody? Right or left? Left. All right, so our little orange line here, never mind the weird plateau thing, but it has shifted to the left relative to our normal curve. What does it mean when we have a left shift? Do we have more affinity of oxygen hemoglobin or less? More, more affinity, okay? So just draw a vertical line here. So at a given PO2, let's say 20, we're gonna have much more oxygen bound to hemoglobin, okay? Um, what do we have going on here with this little flat spot that develops, right? So as we increase the PO2, suddenly we're no longer able to increase our binding of oxygen and hemoglobin. What's unique about what carbon monoxide does? It might explain this. Does anybody know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it occupies two of the avail uh, four available binding sites. Okay, um, you're reading totally this, right? Remember that? Um, I think so. Uh, so we've, we've got four binding sites on each hemoglobin molecule. And what carbon monoxide does is it binds two of them. It binds them very strongly. Okay? And it makes it so that oxygen can't bind to our hemoglobin. So the most we can ever get is 50% saturation can't get above that because two of every hemoglobin molecule's binding sites are, are occupied. Okay. Where do we get carbon monoxide from? Uh, combustion, yeah, combustion of, of hydrocarbons, gasoline, other things, yeah. And, um, and carbon monoxide is something that comes out of tailpipes to a small degree, right? Um, the uh, 
carbon monoxide poisoning, as it's called, is something that is, is very, very dangerous. Um, and in, in order to relieve this, what do we have to do? Anybody familiar with this? Or have an idea? How could you displace the CO2? I'm sorry, the CO, carbon monoxide. Hmm? Yeah, you, you have to provide a very high oxygen content. Okay, and so what, what, what will happen is if you have extremely high plasma O2 levels, that O2 will push the CO, carbon monoxide, out of the way. And you have to get pretty high levels of, of oxygen in the plasma in order to make that happen. But eventually, if you, if you do that, um, you can displace the, the carbon monoxide. Okay. So it's kind of a, an interesting thing that happens to the curve, right? We get this sort of a double whammy. Both are bad, right? We have saturation maxing out at 50%, so you can only carry 50% as much oxygen. You know, the plasma is not really carried much. Okay. And then the, the left shift here makes it so that the oxygen is, is, is having a harder time getting off of hemoglobin, right? As it's passing through systemic capillaries, that oxygen is not jumping off of hemoglobin the way it should because hemoglobin is, uh, has more affinity for oxygen. Okay, so let's let's move on. Unless there are any questions, you guys have any questions about this? Stay away from carbon monoxide. That's that's a good answer, right? All right. So let's talk uh, carbon dioxide transport. And CO two is carried in the blood plasma, as well as the red blood cells. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about that. So we've got three ways that we carry CO2. All right, about 10% of it's in the plasma. All right, so we have a pCO2. We've got another, let's say, quarter of the total that is bound to proteins. Okay, the most common place this um, CO2 will bind is to hemoglobin itself. Okay, so it will bind to hemoglobin. It's not at the same site that oxygen binds though. Okay, oxygen binds Fe2 plus, right? Well, inorganic iron. Um, carbon dioxide will bind to the amino acid part. So we call it carbamino hemoglobin. Okay, carbamino hemoglobin when we have CO2 bound to our hemoglobin molecules. And it'll bind to other plasma proteins as well. So those are carb just carbamino compounds in the blood. So the proteins sort of act as a sponge and, and are able to, to, to hold on to about a quarter of our CO2. And then the last, what's left, 65% is carried by the, co actually converted from CO2 into bicarbonate. Okay. So during the process of loading, right, we've got our, our CO2 being produced by our cells at a constant rate. We've got a PCO2 of about 46, right? Plasma levels are about 40, so the gradient is much smaller than with oxygen. But nonetheless, we still have a gradient, which is sufficient to, to drive movement of CO2. So what happens is CO2 moves uh, into the plasma, we know that, but some of it will also diffuse into the red blood cell. How does it get into the red blood cell? For transport? Simple, simple diffusion, yeah, it just flows right in. Right? CO2 can pass into the cell membrane. Okay? It combines with water with the help of carbonic anhydrase. Okay, so CAH here, carbonic anhydrase, we'll see this again in other parts of the body. This is a, a very common enzyme that helps facilitate this reaction. And what do we get? We get carbonic acid, which dissociates into H plus and bicarbonate. Okay. Bicarbonate is a pretty common thing throughout the body. This is a, 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 a an important negatively charged ion in our body. But bicarbonate is holding within its CO two, right? It's no longer CO two, but we're we're taking up CO two and 
essentially holding it. Okay? This is a reversible reaction, and we can let go of that CO2 hiding within bicarbonate uh, later on. So it, it's reversible, and it's, it's a, we can think of this as a storage form of, of CO2. Okay. So that's what we do. We've got almost two-thirds of it bound up in bicarbonate. Okay. If we wanted to be able to make sure this reaction moves as far to the right as possible, how could we increase the conversion of CO2 to bicarbonate? Obvious one way would be to increase CO2 production by our cells, right? So let's say our cells are making more CO2, that would drive more CO2 to form bicarbonate. But what's another way we could, we could make this equation work for us to help us store CO2 as bicarbonate? Hmm? More water? Yeah. There's lots of water. That's not limiting here, but we'd have problems if we changed the ratios of water. Yeah. Uh, enzymes got to be there. Yeah, if we got more of it, it happens faster. But how do we push the equation to make more bicarbonate in H plus? Yeah. Can you decrease the bicarbonate? Yeah, we're going to decrease the bicarbonate. This is a normal thing that happens in our cells. So as we've got blood flowing through our systemic capillaries here, taking on carbon dioxide. What happens is this little equation runs constantly in our red blood cells, making bicarbonate. And you can imagine that as we build up bicarbonate and H+, we're going to slow down that reaction, right? So what we do is we get rid of the bicarbonate. Okay? So we export the bicarbonate, leaves the red blood cells, and it goes into the blood plasma. Okay. It goes into the blood plasma. So now we've got less bicarbonate in the cell, right? So we sort of decrease the, the, the bicarbonate and that pushes this equation to absorb even more CO2. Okay. So this is this is how we load CO2 into our blood. We've we've got these Obviously, some in the plasma, some in the proteins, and then the red blood cells. Uh, we've got this reaction that's happening naturally, but we also help it along with uh, the export of bicarbonate. Um, there's something known as a chloride shift here, uh, which I want to spend just a second talking about. We're moving chloride in the opposite direction. Okay. So what's going to happen to the amount of chloride in our red blood cells? It's going to go up and in the blood plasma. There it goes down. Okay. It's not all that important. Um, but it's a phenomenon called the chloride shift, where the, the, the blood from here on forward, the, the venous blood of the body, is going to have lower chloride. Okay. What's the significance of using chloride here? Why do we care about chloride? Could we use something else? Yeah. Is it because they both have a negative? It's exactly because they both have a negative charge. Okay, so if we couple this to, uh, let's say, sodium import or hydrogen import, anything, uh, we'd have a problem, right? We don't want to be developing a potential here that's going to limit movement. Okay, so this this movement of chloride is just to maintain the electro neutrality of the process. The most important thing to remember about this is that we have bicarbonate leaving, right? Chloride anti-transporter here is, is just, um, just the mechanism. Right? Okay, so we've got a bunch of CO2 coming in. Okay. And now when we get that blood moves from the veins, right, back to the right side of the heart, it's pumped out to the pulmonary arteries arterials, and then here we're in the pulmonary capillaries. Okay. Now, we're going to be moving CO2 in the opposite direction. Okay. I think I lost my label, but we have about a PO2 of uh, 40 in the alveoli, and what's in the plasma? About 46. Okay. So, CO2 diffuses out, no problem. We lose 
produce CO2 from our proteins. Okay. And then basically we have the opposite problem or the opposite uh, scenario happening here. Okay. So some of the CO2 that's, that's present in the red blood cell is going to leave and go to the plasma. Okay. So what happens to our little equation here when we take CO2 out of the red blood cell? We're going to reverse it, right? We're taking away CO2, which, which is going to favor this equation going back the other way, right? So that's what happens. This equation runs back the other way. Carbonic anhydrase is still there, still facilitates uh, the reaction, makes, makes sure that it happens rapidly. Okay. And we're going to get CO2 leaving. How do we make more CO2? Hint, it has to do with bicarbonate. Increase bicarbonate. We're going to have to increase bicarbonate, aren't we? Okay. So if we don't have a transporter, we're going to have this equation will just run out as bicarbonate runs out of the cell. Okay. But what, we, what happens is that bicarbonate can move back through the transporter. Okay. Move back through the transporter. And why does it go back? We had I bicarbonate out here. Not enough room. Why does bicarbonate have so many letters in it? Right, so we've got high HCO3 minus out here. Right, and as CO2 is leaving, we're going to be running our equation to the left, and we're going to get low bicarbonate inside. And so what happens is this transporter just allows um, bicarbonate to move down its gradient, pumps chloride out, process, right? And what we can do is we can, we can keep bicarbonate levels sufficient inside the cell to continue to drive your carbon dioxide production to the left. Okay, so this equation is not, or this, uh, the chemical reaction here, CO2 and water, bicarbonate and H plus. Um, there's, there's no magic here. It's just, it's, it's going whichever direction has the greatest quantities, right? So we have um, high quantities of CO2 that can diffuse out, right? And we're bringing down CO2 inside the cell. So therefore, the equation is going to run to the left. Right? And when we come back around to the uh, systemic capillaries, CO2 is going to get loaded up. Right, which raises CO2 inside here, right? And we're going to do the opposite. All right, so which way is chloride going to go now? So in our systemic, systemic capillaries, we have chloride coming into the red blood cells and leaving the blood plasma. Right. Now we've got chloride going back, so arterial blood is going to have high levels of chloride. Venous blood is going to have low levels of chloride. Okay. That's called chloride shift. It happens both ways uh, in, in either capillary. OK, questions? Yeah? So with the CO2 leaving with the plasma protein, it's not actually like crossing the boundary the plasma protein how that plasma protein I know you're excited to move on to the Bohr effect plasma proteins don't leave here it's the CO2 that's bound to it okay so if you're you can kind of think of this as its own little reaction, right? So you have CO2 plus, let's call them PP, the plasma proteins. Make my son laugh here. Um, right? And that leaves us with plasma proteins of CO2 down, right? So what happens is also an equilibrium in a way that um, this, this is all happening in the blood. 
proteins never leave the blood for this, but the CO2 comes in and goes out. So when the CO2 comes in to the blood, the systemic capillaries, that goes up and we shift our equation to find more, more of our plasma proteins and hemoglobin. And, and then when CO2 later leaves, right, we shift back to the So it's, it's also a reversible binding reaction. But all this is happening in the blood. The plasma proteins don't leave the blood for this. Yeah? Is it going to mess up that transporter if, like, you just like, injected someone with chloride? If you injected someone with chloride, would it, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, the, the right amount of chloride has to be there in order to allow this transport to happen. Yeah. Yep. What's causing the reversal between the systemic capillaries and the So it's basically that um, the reason that, that chloride is going in or out at different times has to do with the, the bicarbonate concentration. So let me, let me back up here. So in this instance, let me, sorry, okay. So here in the systemic um, capillaries, what's driving this, the chloride movement, and you can kind of think of chloride as being passive here, okay? It'll be moved whichever way bicarbonate wants to, in the opposite direction that bicarbonate's going to go. So here, we've got uh, high levels of bicarbonate because we're generating it as a result of all the CO2 that's coming. Okay. And so out here there's there's relatively little bicarbonate. Okay. And so that is what's driving bicarbonate out and the transporter is is it's coupled to chloride. So the chloride concentrations aren't quite as long as they're stable and normal in the body, they're not going to influence this. Okay. It's the bicarbonate that's that's changing. So here Bicarbonate goes up, and that causes it uh, bicarbonate to leave. And then in the next instance, we have um, yeah, there it is. Um, bicarbonate is now higher outside. We have all that bicarbonate leave, right? And now we're depleting uh, bicarbonate inside of the cell. So the the amount on the inside is uh, depleted, right? So, uh, HCO3, is, right? it's being depleted because we're driving that equation to the left by the removal of CO2, right? And so in this case, bicarbonate runs into the cell. Chloride has just come along for the ride. Okay. <coughs> um, but like, like, like was asked, if we, if we mess the chloride levels, yeah, you can influence this. But the, the transporter's operation is, is just moving with uh, the gradient of bicarbonate. Yeah, secondary active transport, um, an antiporter, um, and instead of being driven by sodium gradients, it's being driven by bicarbonate gradients. But it's important because it provides the bicarbonate for the reaction or removes bicarbonate for the reaction as necessary. All right, Bohr effect. Are you feeling it? A little bit, huh? It's late, really. Okay, so the Bohr effect. This is one other uh, thing that helps us uh, get along. Helps everything work the way that we expect it to. So we've gone through this before. We've got carbon dioxide coming in. We're at systemic capillaries, right? And you remember what also is happening here is that oxygen is unloading. Right? We're leaving, uh, oxygen is leaving the hemoglobin, going to the plasma, and from there it goes over to the interstitial fluid. Okay, so we talked about the, the, the carrying of, of oxygen and the, and, the, and the carrying and the transport of carbon dioxide as independent things, but they're related. Okay? And where they're related is in this, this phenomenon called the Bohr effect. Okay? So what's the common element in these uh, equations? Hydrogen. Okay. So 
you'll notice that on the top equation, we're producing hydrogen. Right? So CO2 comes in, generates hydrogen. Okay? And in the bottom equation, we're moving to the left, and hydrogen is combining with, um, with oxyhemoglobin. Right? And so the Bohr effect is that these equations can be, you can rearrange this into one very long equation. So that as CO2 comes in, right, so as CO2 comes in, it's going to help drive oxygen release. Okay? Because CO2 comes in and it forms hydrogen, and by increasing the hydrogen concentration in our red blood cells, we're pushing the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. Pretty cool, right? So, or maybe not, but it is. You can't fight me on this one. It's very cool. Okay, so that's called the Bohr effect. Um, Niels Bohr, some guy, apparently, found found this out. Right, Niels Bohr. Uh, he's a chemist. But despite that, I like him anyway. Right. All right, so what's, what's the opposite or, or the other situation? There's something called the Haldane effect. Now here, we're in pulmonary capillaries. All right, and what's happening in pulmonary capillaries? We're loading up oxygen, right? And when we do that, we're gonna be generating an H plus. Right? And at the same time, we've got CO2 leaving, right? And so again, this is, this is uh, the opposite scenario that the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin generates a hydrogen that furthers the production of CO2. Right? So here we've got oxygen driving the production of CO2. Okay. This is also cool. And you were getting bored. So, Bohr effect in systemic capillaries, where we have the in input of CO2 that helps in the generation of unbound oxygen, right? And then we've got the Haldane effect, where the input of oxygen in our pulmonary capillaries drives the production of CO2, so we can release even more CO2. These are happening all the time. These are not special phenomena. They just they are happening all the time and explain helps to explain what we observe with the, the movement of gases. Okay. All right. Easy question. If you're awake. If you're not awake, talk to somebody close to you. Say, hey, what do you think? Which effect, or effect or how could be described as a shift to the oxygen hemoglobin association curve. And in which direction? And you're looking back at your slides, that's cheating. No. You can do it if you have to. We can ask this in a different way. Which of these effects? Okay. 